That's all well and good, Jesse. We've got more to get to. Are you ready for rapid fire? I need a sip of water, but I'm ready for rapid fire. <laughs> all right. Catch your breath. Get your drink of water. So here's Marcus Freeman talking about giving up some big pass plays against Central Michigan Saturday. Having a listen here to what he's talking about, why they have Two of the plays, one was missed tackles. We did not tackle well in those first couple series. And then, you know, it was a little bit – the first series were three and out. And then the next series that they scored a touchdown, we had the first ball kick the ball out of bounds, rub the passer, and just miss tackles. And so we can't miss tackles. The one long pass in the second half, um, we're blitzing six guys and we didn't get pressure. Right? And so I can't get mad at the DBs. If we're bringing six guys, man, we have to get pressure. And so we kind of challenge those guys. If we're going to blitz you, let's get pressure so the DBs don't have to cover um, for longer than the, the amount of time we need them to. If we're bringing six guys, we got to get pressure. If we're going to blitz, we got to get pressure. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think when you hear that? So... The best way to describe this is when you blitz, it's kind of like, um, you know, like a teeter totter as a kid, you got, you know, one side and one side that teeter totter is going to be as balanced um, as possible and help each other out as much as possible. So Marcus Freeman really kind of touched on the two biggest things that, that have to happen if you're going to blitz, because if you're going to blitz, you, you got to get to the quarterback because you're, you're not giving your secondary um, as much time. To cover, and so that's what I mean by like the teeter totter, right? Like mm -hmm. this, uh, the, the blitz has to do its job so that it's not, you know, teetered, right? Like you don't want to leave your your secondary into um, a bad position or, or an unfortunate position. So I, I get what he's saying there, and I think um, the, the the more important part is is the the poor the poor tackling because if you're gonna blitz, that basically leaves everyone on the backside and, and sort of a man to man type, you know, principle. Right. And so if you're in that kind of look and you miss a tackle, <laughs> well, that guy is just going to, you know, if, if you make a miss and, and he makes, you know, if he breaks a tackle, then it, it's it's instantly going to be five, ten more yards downfield just because everyone else is locked up on their guy. Right. And so bad tackling is just going to lead to um, more yak yards, um, stuff like that, because there's just not as many zones on the field covered um, as at one point. And I, I just think the tackling was so poor last week after being, you know, very, very good the, the first three weeks. And it's just, it's, it's how much of a, you know, maybe even like a placebo effect of Bertrand not being out there, right? Like does everyone else's game just naturally take a step well, back? When you know, you're Bertrand's playing one out guy there? out of position. You're putting Kaiser in a spot that he probably, you know, that he shouldn't be a middle linebacker. There's a reason he's not the middle linebacker, but you went with experience, over, you know, some youth and inexperience and, and that kind of thing. And it, it, it just, when you see the blitzing and it just looks like they're running into a brick wall and they're not doing anything with the blitzes. And then the, you have all that stuff behind it that you're talking about. It's like, why, why well, do you a, keep doing this? That's, yeah. And that's my biggest, I guess, concern or complaint about golden still a little bit too much is, He's just blitzing too much against quarterbacks that are very average, right? And so, like, you have to allow average quarterbacks to beat you um, with the arm. And I get it. Like, it's still good to bring blitzes here and there because you want to speed up Kyle McCord. You want to, you know, throw off his looks and his reads, etc. Yeah, I'm not like, saying never. I blitz. get all of that, but they, like, you got to tone the frequency. Yeah. They need to be better timed. They need to be better designed. You know, just just the whole thing. And they need to be better executed as well and like what it's it's also annoying a lot that you'll see the quarterback kind of vary his cadence at the line of scrimmage and notre dame is tipping their blitzes in a lot of different instances as well so it's like they know it's coming and then they still cut you know because like the, you can tell you know by the cadence you see the guy creeping up toward the line of scrimmage and then he has to stop and then he has to back off and then the ball is actually snapped and he goes again and it's 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 not being it's not being disguised very well in a lot of cases either. Yeah, and I, the, to me, <laughs> the biggest thing that comes with uh, blitzing a team like Ohio State is you leave the potential for a one on one with Marvin Harrison. That's you it. The potential uh, with, with uh, the all you have to do receiver. is look at last year's game and see what happened. It wasn't even it wasn't even one of the big two. 
you know? Right. And that's, that's like, that's almost why it's like a no go to me because you can bail out Ohio state by blitzing and allowing one broken coverage and Marvin Harrison jr. Just to hit, you know, some sort of deep downfield ball. So it's just, you got to be really selective. And if I'm Notre Dame, I'm personally not bringing six, I'm, I'm bringing five at most. I, I might bring a six like once or twice, you know, here, like mm-hmm. very, very infrequently. Um, but you, you just can't compromise the secondary. And I know the secondary has been really good. Um, and I don't think that they'll, you know, that this is their biggest challenge, but yeah, you, you just can't you can't bank on your secondary playing well against uh, the talent of wide receiver that Ohio State has. So exactly, I just don't think it's worth the gamble to continuously blitz and and, and continuously test that theory of can our secondary hold up with probably one of the best wide receiver rooms in the country. Completely agree. So Freeman was asked about the pass rush yesterday, <laughs> and uh oh. <laughs> Henry's Henry's big on pass rush, apparently. So they have just six sacks through four games this season, but they're number one in the country in pass efficiency defense. And here is what Mr. Freeman had to say about that. It's, listen, I, I knew someone was going to ask me about it, but like, sacks, I, I really keep talking about sacks, sacks, sacks. I told Coach Golden, man, we're number one in the country in pass efficiency defense. And so that's the stat I'm worried about. I'm not worried about sacks. The pressure that we're getting is great. Like, sacks will come. And I don't want our players overly concerned about sacks because that that's an individual, true individual stat that really doesn't matter. Like, I want to be number one in pass efficiency defense. I don't know who's number one in sacks, but I want to be number one in pass efficiency defense. That's a great stat. And so they've been working and <coughs> doing really well. And, you know, sacks are, are a result of a lot of different things, you know. But um, I, I was – Really happy with with the way our defense performed in the past game. Um, you know, to, to limit that that offense to what we did, it was really really good. Pleased to see. So, Jess, are you okay with the pass rush if they're still the best in pass efficiency defense in the nation? Yeah, because all all pass rush is doing is trying to help out your secondary, right? Like we just kind of yeah. talked about the teeter totter there a little bit. Like every team wants to be able to get pressure to sack the quarterback or basically force a unsuccessful passing attempt, right? And so if you look at pass efficiency defense and the metrics that go into it, it's the opponent's passer passing completion percentage. It's the number of interceptions. It's the interception percentage. It's opponent's total yards passing, opponent's yards per pass attempt, and opponent's touchdown passing percentage. So those six metrics are what play into pass efficiency defense. And basically what that means is how how much are you giving up, you know, in the air on defense? Is it allow you know yards? Is it getting first downs? Is it you know a high uh, play per yard? You know um, yards per play? You know is it seven yards per play using the passing game? And then is it is it leading to touchdowns? Is it allowing you know points to be scored uh, via touchdown? And so if your pass efficiency defense is down, then that's really all it matters because again blitzing or, or sorry sacks is all is helping that out, right? Like that's, it's a direct correlation. Kind of funnels it in that direction. Yeah, exactly. It's just helping. That's what it's helping already, right? Like that's what you want. You want the, the, the sacks to help your pass efficiency defense. And so even if you're not getting sacks and your pass efficiency is still down, well, then it's really no concern because again, the, the only thing that sacks do is help your pass efficiency defense. And so if you're still successful without the sacks, then uh, thinking about it would be that sacks would be like the cherry on top, right? Like if they can get those sacks up, then it's really scary because then but, your pass efficiency goes even higher. Well, yeah, exactly. And I, I think the other side of that is there are still good things. Sacks aren't totally an individual thing because there are still good things that come with sacks, like loss of yardage, putting a team in turnovers, second and 15, as opposed to, just second and 10 because you pressured the quarterback and got an incomplete, you know, those kind of things. And yes, exactly. Sacks can also be strip sacks. They become turnovers and all these different things. So I don't think you completely discount it, but I also like that initial comment that we were talking about, about you can't rush six if you're not getting home. That was from the post game Saturday night. The comment that we just heard about pass efficiency was from yesterday. And they obviously go hand in hand a little bit. That's that's kind of why I'm I'm talking about it. But it also kind of seems like maybe 
with the pass efficiency in mind because Marcus Freeman said, I, you know, I had a conversation with, with Al Golden, you know, like maybe over the, you know, in the, in the day and a half post game. And up until yesterday, you know, the conversation was had about maybe we dial down the blitzing a little bit because we're really good at covering. We can still affect the quarterback, even if we're not trying to, to blitz him and do some of those kind of things. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see kind of how that plays out this week, especially in this game. Yeah. And, and again, I think it's like, look at the Steelers last night, like their sacks and everything is ultimately, you know, what, what won that game for them. Right. And so like, you can't, you can't just abandon, uh, you know, getting sacks and the pass rush and everything like that, just because you've been um, unsuccessful to start. But I, I just think that getting sacks will ultimately just like kind of put this defense over the top because I think they're doing a lot of good things already without the sacks. I think so as well. I think so. And look, the more you can put a quarterback into obvious passing situations, the better chance you have of getting home on some of those and not having to blitz either. You know, I think I think they all kind of play into each other. But the fact that you've got such a good secondary means that you can do some different things. If I see one safety blitz from Al Golden this weekend, <laughs> oh no, I might break my TV oh, no. in half. Oh, no. Let's not go there. Let's not go there. <laughs> so Freeman was asked yesterday what the actual impact of a potential big red presence of Ohio State fans could make on the game. In other words, sea of red like Georgia a few years ago. How does that actually impact your players, what effect could it have? Here's what Freeman said. We want to see a lot of green in here. That's the, the cool thing about Saturday is, is we've got green jerseys, and um, I don't know if they're calling it a green out, but we want to see a lot of green. And, and I think our players notice it and appreciate that, um, especially pregame, as you just said. Uh, we want to make sure there's as many Notre Dame fans as we can. And uh, I think they're doing some cool things uh, for the fan experience. And so, I encourage our fans, man, make sure that you guys are here and, and let's get as much green in the stadium as we can. So he didn't actually go to <laughs> what impact would the red have? He's just like, yeah, we want a bunch of green in there. So what impact, what actual impact would it have on you? If you're a Notre Dame player and you come out into the stadium and you see red everywhere inside your home stadium. Yeah, I think the biggest like impact that I would see about, you know, the, the sea of red in my home, own home stadium is that is the big advantage of this game because both of these teams are very good. They're very, you know, these are top 10 teams, they're powerhouses. And so ultimately what can be the deciding factor is, you know, the home field advantage. And so when a team like Notre Dame comes out and they see, you know, maybe they, they come out and, and they, they, they see or feel more of that red presence. They hear it, they feel it. I think really what that does is kind of like lowers the confidence a little bit. It, it, it doesn't allow them to naturally kind of settle into the game and it, and it can allow some of that doubt to kind of creep in, right? Like it, like it, it almost feels like, you know, the, the comfortability um, of playing at home and knowing that your fans are there. I think when you allow some of that opposing team to come in, it, it diminishes again, that comfortability. And then you start to panic just a little bit more. Right. And, and you just don't feel um, necessarily, as comfortable. So it would be a great advantage if Notre Dame can take over that stadium and just be as loud as possible, get that place um, shaken. And I don't know if you've seen this, but like <laughs> there's this lady, she covers Notre Dame. She's a lawyer. I can't remember um, who she is, but she is continuously tweeting at Notre Dame football that there are, there are seats, you know, the gold, the golden seats behind Notre Dame, uh -huh. Those tickets are being scalped on SeatGeek, and those tickets are very specifically given out to people. And so Notre Dame football can easily tell based on location, you know, section and seat number, basically who that person is that is scalping out their tickets. But every time she comes across these, you know, like golden seat tickets, basically seats outside of, you know, Ohio State's designated area mm -hmm. and people that are season ticket holders or people that are like, you know, considered like longtime members of Notre Dame. And that golden they're, seat section, they can see who's basically giving up their seats and selling high for ten thousand dollars. They're donor seats, yes, and and that's you know I, I think we touched on it a little bit yesterday, or somebody did. That's like it it tends to be the older crowd, 
and you know the 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 people like that who end up selling their seats and not coming into town and then you know you have people complaining about sea of red and stuff like that i said this before if you want to ensure there's no sea of red there's there's not a whole lot you can do about it at this point but if you were going to sell your tickets you need to make sure that you're selling them to Notre Dame fans and or if you're a, a Notre Dame fan needed to be trying to buy up tickets as long ago as possible but you're absolutely right and and, and that's the kind of stuff and those are those are seats that are obviously close to the field but you know, they're look, behind Notre Dame. They're literally right behind Notre Dame's bench. You want yeah. so, you want if Ohio you State afford, in that territory? If you can afford those seats to begin with, it's not like selling those seats is going to give you some big monetary advantage because you've got <laughs> enough money. You know what you I probably, mean? You like, can afford those tickets for a reason, right? If you're if you're somebody else who's on you know a median income or whatever, and you've got tickets to the game. And you spend a couple hundred bucks for those tickets, but you can get three to five times the face value. You're going to benefit a lot more from what you're going to get from those than the people selling those tickets that you're talking about or selling them for. So, yeah. Uh, and K-Max says the noise matters, and that's right. It's, it's, it does. It's kind of like, have to have that home field advantage in these big games. It's kind of like SoFi out in Los Angeles. When the 49ers come to town, there's red everywhere down there because – LA still doesn't have a home field advantage because those teams haven't even been around long enough and, and opposing fans fill those stadiums. It's, I mean, it's, it's definitely louder. The cheers are louder for the 49ers than the Rams in SoFi (laughs) down there. And what you don't want is, is, is I think the red doesn't matter as much as it is the effect on the crowd. Is it an actual home field advantage in terms of, you when want, your offense is on the field and you need right. quiet in the stadium and those kind of things. You want Ohio State's defense and offense to be as uncomfortable as possible because of the fans. Like you want the fans to maximize that level of uncomfortability um as possible. And so like it's it's a big deal. Like you want you want Ohio State, you want first time quarterback Kyle McCord going on the road in a top 10 matchup to be screaming because he can't get the plays called across the field you know, false starts, like a false start here and there. If you get, you know, two, three of them, those are big deals because it can get them behind the chains in a series and that can lead to a punt down the road. So like, it's very important, you know, it it, it matters too. So how much red do you think we actually see? Do you think it's 50, 50? Do you think it gets that far? No, I think maximum you'll see like uh, 15, 20% of red. I think it's going to be about 10 to 15% red at the end of the day. You think that's it? Yeah. Even with these kind of people, you know, like they're out there tracking these. these. I just think that like in in some of these games, like I don't think Notre Dame has felt this good about the program and the head coach in a really long time. Right. Like I, I, I think a lot of people got fed up with Brian Kelly towards the end. And I think a lot of people were just kind of tired of the same old, same old, you know, Notre Dame would beat who they were supposed to. And then when they came down to the big games, they would lose a close one every time. And I, so I just think that really um, wore a lot of fans down. But now that you have this kind of rejuvenated team, you know, we have a quarterback that's explosive and dynamic. Uh, we have a running game that's explosive and dynamic. You have a defense that is very complimentary. And you just have a head coach that everyone loves, you know, like the, Marcus Freeman is a man of the people. And I think that also goes I mean, that's a fair, long way. Because Georgia in 2017, when it happened, was right after the debacle of 2016. And I I think you're right. I think a lot of Notre Dame fans sold their seats. I hope that it's not – I don't think it will approach 50-50. But at the same time, seeing the photos of both the Georgia game and Nebraska going all the way back to 2000, the reports were only about 30,000 fans from from those – fan bases being inside Notre Dame stadium, but the Nebraska game, especially that stadium, man, was there was red everywhere in that stadium. There had to be more than 30,000 Nebraska fans for that game. You know, another thing to me is I I think Ohio state's kind of arrogance might play into this a little bit too, because I think they think they're better than Notre Dame. And I think that they they definitely do. And I definitely think that they don't believe, like, I don't think that they think that, you know, them bringing more fans, could help them because I think they think they're going to win regardless. And so I think Ohio State's arrogance can also play against them 
um, to some degree. Cause I mean, I, there's people, I'm not kidding you. Like I, my, my boss is an Ohio state grad. He went to Ohio state and I was talking to him last week and he was like, yeah, you know, like, you know, Ohio state's done this, this, and this. And I was like, yeah, but you had success against Western Kentucky and Youngstown state. He's like, yeah, well, you know, like Notre Dame is Notre Dame. At the end of the day, I'm not overly concerned. Like we should still win by 10. And I was like, all right, man, if that's what you want to think, I hope that like that's what I want all of Ohio State fans thinking because it's going to hurt even worse when Notre Dame really gives it to them this Saturday. I don't it's, think they're ready for it. And I think their arrogance is going to play against them in terms in of the fans. Georgia and Nebraska cases. It was like a once in a generation trip to Notre Dame Stadium right. type thing. Now, Ohio State has been here more recently, but it's still been almost 30 years. It's been 27 years since. Yeah, but I just don't feel like this game is they don't equate this as it doesn't mean level. Right. As like, you know, Michigan or whatever. It's just Ohio State just thinks outside of like the playoffs, Michigan and the national championship, they're above all the other matchups. They're just going to it's mop up duty for them. And I think their fans think the same way. Wicked Bronco, thanks for the super chat as always. He says, don't want to jinx it, but I think Notre Dame beats Ohio State by 14 plus. Ohio State fans for the first time are afraid of this game. I just hate the national media picking Notre Dame to win this game for a change. I wanted to be the underdog. I haven't heard a whole lot of national media. I don't know, like, specifically who you're talking about. I saw, I I saw a prediction a today lot. that was like, uh, this guy that's, he's like me, very analytical. He's got like a really crazy intense like breakdown and he saw he he was favoring ohio state still 27 to 24 is kind of what he he was seeing um and, and that's really where right where i kind of see the game falling as well but um i told you this yesterday and i'm telling everyone again i like notre dame by nine and a half i don't think this game is determined by a field goal i think it's going to be at least a touchdown either way um and yeah i just i i'm i'm gonna tease notre dame at minus nine and a half everyone else is is free to do <laughs> whatever they want <laughs> i don't have that's 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 a lot andre says he thinks both defenses will have a lot of success but notre dame run game will be the reason why they win this game thoughts on that oh 100 percent uh notre dame has to be able to run the ball you know based off of those whiteboards i was just going into off 11 and 12 personnel um they have to establish the line of scrimmage get that run game going because what's that that's going to do is it's going to suck in those linebackers. It's going to suck in those deep safeties and corners. And then it's just those one steps that allows, you know, the tight ends to sneak in behind them. And then maybe, you know, maybe they hit a deep post route or corner route off of that because, you know, those those hybrid safety linebackers are, um, you know, sneaking down a little bit, getting their eyes into the backfield. But that run game is going to set it up, set it up, set it up. And then, boom, you start hitting pass. Boom, you start hitting pass. And then you go back to that power run game. Go back to that power run game. You keep – Hitting him in the chin. To me, it's like it's like a boxing uh, match, in my opinion. I think you start off kind of in the early rounds of the boxing match, you know, going you know blow for blow, heavy run, a lot of power runs. Towards the middle rounds, you go towards you know a little bit more play action, pass plays, maybe straight straight up pass plays. Jab Sweet, a taking bit, those, yeah, dance. take yeah, you know, getting around a little bit, and then you come back and you, you try to get those knockouts in the later rounds again. With again coming back to that power run game to finish them off. So that's the formula I see. Yeah, I think Notre Dame needs to run the ball, but I, I I think that more key is going to be Notre Dame stopping Ohio State's run because again, I don't I think their offensive line really for both two of the biggest questions in this game I think are the offensive lines for for both teams and how Notre Dame is is able to do is one thing, but I think specifically for Ohio State if if Notre Dame can keep young Kyle McCord behind the chains all night and make him put him into obvious passing situations. I think that's really going to favor Notre Dame. And you put him in obvious passing situations by shutting down their run game. Yeah. I think Michael Hahn just made a really uh, important comment too. You need to stay your volumes down a little bit. I, I think Michael Hahn brought up a really good point of you need to stay within touching distance, right? Like you can't like in a boxing match, you got to stay within that touching distance, keep the score close um, because you can't, you know, the last thing you want is to get separated and the Notre Dame feels like they got to start throwing these haymakers, long shots after long shots. Like you got to keep, got to keep things nice and close. And then if you're Notre Dame, obviously you want to pull away. You don't want uh, Ohio state to pull away. Yeah. B feeder says in all fairness, he got tickets from an NC state season ticket holder behind the Notre Dame bench, but they were a hundred dollars each. Yeah. And again, that's why um, that is not a home field advantage <laughs> that they have. 
at North Carolina State, as we have talked about. And the implications of that, you know, Notre Dame, North Carolina State is not Notre Dame, Ohio State. So there's there's a little bit of a difference. I get what you're saying. But, you know, we know here at Notre Dame, those are donor seats. Those are expensive seats that, uh, that we're talking about there. So we've got this home and a home, Notre Dame and Ohio State, the last two years. First time they've done it since 1995 and 96. What's the next team you would like to see the Irish schedule a home and home with? Um, so to me, I was looking at, you know, like over the last two decades, Notre Dame has done a good job of playing like a variety of different teams. Um, and, you know, we've seen home and homes with Georgia. Um, we've seen them play Michigan a lot. We've seen them do the Texas. home and home with Texas. We saw them do a home and home with Oklahoma. Uh, you saw Tennessee in there back in like 2008, 2009. Um, uh, kind of, I'm starting to trying to think a little. I mean, they've played North Carolina a good amount. They've played. Well, that's an um, ACC school, so yeah. You see, US. I'm just going through like you know bigger names, right? Um, but in terms of maybe teams that they haven't done in a while, I think a, I have like three that come to mind. Um, I think Oregon would be fun. I think uh, if you wanted to get down. Um, into the south a little bit I think Florida would be fun um, and then to me someone and this one's kind of you know this this person this team kind of comes up um, a little bit here and there oh actually I'd add Ole Miss in there as well so you got like Oregon Florida Ole Miss and then my fourth one would be and this one is a team that Notre Dame used to play a little bit uh, not a little bit but you know when they're playing that more of that Big Ten heavy schedule and a lot of people have been asking about this team to come back I wouldn't mind Penn State as well, just because of, you know, again, Penn State is a, a good team. Um, they're consistently good, you know, regionally. They're, they're close to each other. Um, but I, I like the, the more of the home run hitter. So give me like Old Miss, maybe a little home and home with Oregon. I would say Washington as well, but like I just don't want, want it to be in one of those like down years of Washington's, right? Like I, I want to play Washington. Washington's too much of up and down for me. I want to be able to play a team that I know is consistently good. Michigan was suggested. Um, they're coming up here, and it'll be a little while still. It's a few years in the distance, but there will. It, there's at least it's on the schedule. It's going to happen. Texas, John says Alabama, Wisconsin That's fell on, through. Sorry, didn't Alabama. Mean Alabama, <laughs> yes, again, Alabama's on the schedule. That's you know that's going to again. It's in the distance, but it's going to happen in the 2030s. Texas A and M is coming up. At some point, I think we're going to get that Arkansas home. And I would love to see the two that you mentioned, Oregon and Penn State. It's It's been, what, we're 15 plus years since Notre Dame played that home and home with Penn State when they came here and then Notre Dame went out there. I'd like to see that again at some point. And I'd like to see Oregon because that's a team that Notre Dame hasn't played. I'd like to see Notre Dame do a home and home with Oregon. I think Oregon's always – always willing to do them too. You know, it feels like Oregon's playing a big home and home with someone like every year, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's, I like that. I, I, I don't necessarily think it should be the first game of the year though. I don't, that's the one part I don't like, cause I don't like doing a home and home with a team like Oregon, the very first game of the season. Um, I, yeah. I like it, you know, more so kind of where they're at right now, four five, six game area. Yeah. Um, What's going to make it difficult though, is all this, the conference expansion with them joining the big 10. It's going to be interesting. You know, to see what Notre Dame is going to continue to be able to do with Big Ten schools <laughs> going forward. F Oregon. I wouldn't give them the exposure, <laughs> says El Conquistador. So college game day, of course, is going to be there this week. I've seen a lot of this on social media over the last couple of days. I'll ask you, who should be the guest picker this weekend? Um, So, like, the guest picker is always someone that's, like, you know, like celebrity status that has like relevance to Notre Dame. Right. And so like, to me, <laughs> that breaks down to like four people. Um, I think you, they, you could potentially see him go in house with a guy like Digger Phelps. Um, I think you could also see Regis. Um, but I think he's a little bit too oh, old at this point. Regis is actually dead at this oh, point. Oh, sorry. So. He's, he's, he's passed. <laughs> Can't go with that one. Um, Not, yes. <laughs> Reaches and then is not happening. That's I, that's all I'm saying. I think there's Bon Jovi. Um, I I think that's a little lame. 
personally. I think with the concerts and, you know, everything else, they've maxed out the Bon Jovi stuff. To me, there's one clear and defiant answer. It is Vince Vaughn, baby. Get Vince Vaughn on that plane and into game day. That's who I would go with. Yeah, some people, Jason said Dick Vitell. Vince Vaughn is one of the first ones that came to mind. I think he makes a lot of sense. He's a Notre Dame fan. Bring him in. People have said Miles Teller because he's a Notre Dame fan. Okay, I could, I could live with him. I, I guess Taylor Swift is another one I've seen floated oh, out there. Please I think no, please you, no. You would, you would say no to the Swifties. Her brother, please, of course, no. went to Notre Dame, so I think that there's a connection there. Golick Senior. I mean, he's here. Wouldn't mind seeing that. I think Bon Jovi makes a lot of sense as well. I like your first suggestion, though. Vince Vaughn, I think, is the way to go. If you can get Vince Vaughn, get him in there. Dick Vitale, I, I don't know what kind of physical. To me, there's again, right there's now. like there's there's he, two sides of this. There's like the ESPN side in house and the non side. I think the ESPN in house is either uh, Digger Phelps or one of the Golics, and then if you go outside of that, it's either Bon Jovi or Vince Vaughn. I prefer going outside of it and Vince Vaughn. I like that. I like it a lot. Fill in the blank. It's blank that USC at Colorado on September 30th is going to kick off at noon Eastern time on Fox, which is 10 a.m. in Colorado. It's an abomination uh, <laughs> to those Colorado players. That's that's like high school JV stuff right there, playing at 10 a.m. on a Saturday, 9 a.m. on a Saturday. I just I I get like okay I don't get why they're doing it but I do get it because of scheduling you want to you know stack up make sure you got an important game in every window but Colorado shouldn't be playing at 10 a.m. local time that's just that's sleepwalking football that's it, it is an important game of the year and I just feel like if you want you know what that game if you want the maximum potential out of that game it's not playing that game at 10 a.m. Colorado time well I tell you what they have uh they're maxing the potential on Colorado is what they're doing because that that Colorado Colorado State game which kicked off at 10 p.m. the opposite of 10 a.m. 9.3 million viewers made it the most watched late night college football game ever on ESPN. Everyone wants a piece of Colorado right now. And I tell you what, this is a Fox game and they like that noon window. So get used to it, USC, you know, because that's obviously going to be 9 a.m. when they kick off Pacific time. They'll be in mountain time, so it won't be, you know, again, it, it'll be 10 a.m. where they're kicking off, but their fans are going to have to get up at 9 a.m. Get used to it because you're a big-name product, and I think you're going to see a lot of USC, Ohio State, UCLA, Ohio State, USC, Michigan, and Penn State and those you're going to see a lot of noon kickoffs I think the question is going to be will they ever actually do it 9 a.m pacific time like will USC or UCLA or Oregon or Washington will they host one of those 9 a.m games Ooh. ultimately that's going to be the question Fox has got the TV rights to it and they want to maximize their dollars Colorado is hot right now so they're going to I agree. I think it stinks that they're doing it, but they're going to maximize it all they can. And I think you're going to see even more of it in the future, especially with, uh, again, with, with USC going to the Big Ten, you're going to see a lot more of it. And Colorado, obviously, is going to the Big 12 next year. So they, you know, they won't be a part of it. And for right now, anyway, Fox has got them on their airwaves. So they're, 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 they're chasing – they're chasing the prime. They're going to get all they can at a prime well, did you in Colorado. See that uh, tweet I sent you about the viewership that that Colorado and Colorado State game got? It was like 11 point something million at its apex. And it's like, right. that's Colorado and Colorado State. You add in Colorado and the ex Heisman and, you know, the Heisman front runner again for this season. It's like, I can only imagine what those numbers are going to be. And so that's all it is. And that's, you know, the, it goes back to this is. This is the common denominator in all of this, the conference reshuffling, you know, teams leaving, you know, scheduling games. It's all about maximizing, maximizing dollars and viewership. And that's that's what they're going to do. So yeah. Irish 17 says bring back to Rico for this game. Oh, you won't get to Rico, but you're getting Noah Eagle and Todd Blackledge for this game. So step up and broadcast. Did anyone else game. think it was funny that. 
Like Jack Collinsworth made his comeback. I, I feel like Jack Collinsworth milked his time off because people don't know that he, he's not really uh, liked too much. I think he doesn't look forward to doing the Notre Dame games, actually. I, I don't know. I didn't. It didn't record because it was on Peacock and I don't pay for the premium <laughs> Peacock service. So I didn't get to see any of that. So I don't know. I cannot respond. All right. Well, that's going to do it for tonight. I, again, I apologize for the bad timing on, 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 on the Cleveland Indians t-shirt. That was not intentional. This is, this is Cleveland. This is not, you know, that's not an O on the t-shirt. So didn't mean to do it. Jesse, good stuff with the whiteboard tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Hit the like button on your way out. And of course, subscribe, rate, and review. We'll talk to you tomorrow on IB Nation Sports Talk.